Good morning, friends. My name is John Donaldson, the pastor of Burns Memorial United Methodist Church. This is a sermon for Sunday, October 8th, 2023. And you see from our bulletin cover that it has to do with servanthood. The bulletin cover picture today is from an artist that attends church here, Mike Drake. And this is a picture of his painting, the painting entitled Jesus Washing the Feet of a Modern Man. Our scripture today is from Matthew chapter 20, reading verses 25 through 28, and it relates to the picture. Jesus called them together, called his disciples together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. Most of you are familiar with this person's picture, and you could probably say his name is Dave Thomas. David Thomas, he was the founder of Wendy's. He passed on a few years ago. A familiar sight was in a lot of his company's television commercials. He also appeared in a lot of in-store training videos, and, and uh, like like he is here, he would be uh, dressed like one of his workers. And one of these, he has uh, uh, a, a company's annual report, but he's dressed holding uh, next to the annual report uh, in a work apron, holding a mop and a plastic bucket. Uh, for many years, that picture of him holding the bucket would be in the manager's offices at Wendy's. And I think he's trying to get his managers to adopt his kind of servant attitude. Thomas didn't finish high school. He worked his way through the ranks of, of Colonel Sanders' Kentucky Fried Chicken before he started his own uh, food franchise. Uh, here's how he explained his picture. He said, uh, the picture, not this one, the picture where he's holding the, the mop bucket, mop in the bucket. He said, I got my MBA a long time before I got my GED. At Wendy's, an MBA does not stand for Masters of Business Administration. He said, it stands for Mop Bucket Attitude. Servant attitude, kind of like what Chick-fil-A says now. It's my pleasure to serve you. Dave Thomas taught all of his employees that service comes before success. I think the Wendy's owner could have learned that from Jesus, that, that, that uh, service comes before success and is the key ingredient of success. Just to give you the, the context for our reading today, Jesus talking about servanthood. Uh, in that context, it's clear who's in charge. In this first century world, around the Mediterranean, the Romans were in charge, there's no doubt. Uh, you would kiss the Romans' rings and, and uh, bow to their power. They had authority everywhere they were. Uh, and the higher up in rank in the Roman system, the more authority they had and more whatever they say would happen. It was raw power. You take orders from them and you do them as fast as you can. Kind of raw, do what I tell you kind of power. But Jesus is going to teach a different way. He teaches it by what he does and by what he says for us to do. The first thing that comes up in the story in our text today is uh, uh, right before this is his prediction of what's going to happen in Jerusalem. This is the third time Jesus has says this, but this time he's very clear. He says, when I go in Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be uh, uh, tried and beaten and scourged and crucified and killed. And the third day I will rise again from the dead. Now, this is the third time, as I said, that he's mentioned this. He's predicted this. And I, I, don't, I think maybe the disciples have tuned this out. Uh, they don't seem to think uh, that, that this is likely to happen. I think Jesus is probably bringing it up because this is Matthew chapter 20. The next chapter, 21, is Palm Sunday. And uh, chapters 21 to 28, the end of the book, is all about this last week, this Holy Week event. And so he's letting his disciples know what's coming. And I don't really think that he believes that they're going to believe what he's saying. I think he's saying this so that after the fact, after he rises from the dead, uh, they can look back and say, it happened. It happened just like he said it was going to happen. Uh, the heart of his prediction, of course, is the cross. Uh, he's about to live out John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Jesus is about to sacrifice himself for humanity in order to lead humanity to eternal life. Now, as soon as Jesus makes this profound and painful and, and yet victorious prediction, as soon as he makes this prediction, two of his best disciples come up to him and haven't been paying attention at all. They come up to him and, and ask for seats of power. Uh, I think Jesus is about to go into Jerusalem. They think, I think that they think that Jesus is about to go into Jerusalem and take over. He's going to be a conquering king. They've seen him feed thousands of people, walk on water, calm storms. Nothing can happen. He couldn't be killed or arrested. Nothing can happen to somebody with this kind of power. They think he's about to go in and take over, and they want to have good seats in this coming kingdom. They want to be able to say things and people do whatever they command because they're Jesus' right and left-hand man. And so, very Catholic-like, they, they get their mother involved. Uh, they, uh, they say, Mom, can you... Uh, ask Jesus to do this for us. I mention Catholics because Catholics will sometimes pray to Mary uh, or, or you know, as if they're praying to Mary, ask them to ask her to ask Jesus to do some favor, benefit for them. Uh, the other gospels don't mention that, that Mrs. Zebedee is a part of this, but evidently she was and, and they involved her in this request. Uh, <clears throat> now, now, whatever they thought was coming, Jesus brings it back to him. He says, uh, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Are you able, says the master, to be crucified with me? He asks them. Uh, they say, yes, yes, sure. We can, we'll, we'll go along with you. We're, we're there. Jesus then bursts their bubble. He says, well, I don't make the seating arrangements at this uh, feast in heaven. It's not for me to say who's going to be on the right side and who's going to be on the left side, but indeed you will drink the cup that I'm going to drink from. Uh, and then he calls all the other disciples there, the other nine, and he gives them uh, his, his words about leadership. This great passage, you know that rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercised authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus states that how, how, this is how the world leads, but not so among us. We're called to a different way. You know, the Apostle Paul says that we've all been predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his Son, all of us who have the Holy Spirit within us who are God's people. We're, we're called to be predestined that God is doing a work on us. And part of this work is learning to lead uh, as Jesus led, learning to serve as Jesus served. Friends, to be a disciple is to be open to grow. So hear what Jesus uh, had to say about leadership. We're called to do things differently. There's a businessman named Robert K. Greenleaf. He was an engineer and a math student. Worked, went to work for AT&T in 1926. Stayed with him for 38 years. Rose in the organization to a management trainer and troubleshooter. And he had some radical ideas. Here's a picture of Robert Greenleaf uh, next to his wife, uh, Esther. He had some radical ideas. He said the organization exists for the person as much as the person exists for the organization. Uh, <clears throat> when he retired in 1964, he began to write about leadership. And he's the first person to use the word servant leader. He coined the phrase a servant leader. And he said a key tool of servant leadership is listening and persuasion, access to intuition and foresight, use of language and pragmatic measures and outcomes. Greenleaf wrote, and I had this quote in the, in the back of the bulletin, the servant leader is servant first. It begins with a natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then the conscious choice that brings one to aspire to lead. That person is different than the person who wants to lead first. He says the servant leader looks to serve first and is called then to leadership. So on the surface, if you use the word servant leadership, it sounds like an oxymoron, like a contradiction in terms like jumbo shrimp. You can't be jumbo and shrimp or definitely maybe. Either it's definite or it's a maybe or express mail. Either it's happening now or you're putting in the mail. What's express mail? Or 12 pound cake or Microsoft works. Uh, kind of an oxymoron. 
Servant leadership sounds like a contradiction. How do we put this into practice, what Jesus is saying about service? Uh, and even Jesus' example here is a little bit confusing. Yes, he goes to the cross. He also makes a whip at one point and clears the money changers out of the temple. Yes, he fasted in the wilderness. He also cast out demons and raised the dead. What does it mean to be a servant leader, Jesus style? Well, first off, I, I, there, there are a couple principles. First principle, I think, is that servant leader is to realize that we are a servant first. It's serving God first, putting God first. Jesus is asked, what is the first and greatest, what is the, the greatest of the commandments? And he says, the first and greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Put God first. Psalm 123 reads, As the eyes of the slaves look to their master, as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God. We're about being servants. That's why I think Jesus taught, uh, emphasized uh, uh, submission in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. It's not about John's kingdom, not about your kingdom. It's about God's kingdom come. God's will being done. Jesus taught these words and he lived these words in the Garden of Gethsemane where uh, he says, I would that this cup would pass from me, but not what I will, but what your will be done. Servant leadership. It's about putting God first. And sometimes people around us won't understand that. Uh, they won't understand your commitment uh, about putting God first. They won't understand commitment even if the world doesn't seem to appreciate putting God first. Mother Teresa, uh, there's a poem that's attributed to Mother Teresa. It was found on the wall, had been on the wall of her, of her uh, mission in Calcutta for many, many years. And people wrote about it and how she has it framed and, and put there on the wall. And I don't know if she wrote these words or found these words, but they were important enough for her so that she saw them. And uh, the, the, the women who are part of her ministry would see these words every day. And they go like this. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you stand, what you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you have anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. Between you and God, it was never between you and them anyway. Servant leadership means putting God first. And the world may not understand it, may not understand your your consistency, your commitment, regardless of, of whether you're accepted or, or or persecuted for your commitment. It's about putting God first and serving God first. Secondly, servant leadership is about building up others to accomplish the mission of serving God. It's about building up the team so that as a team, you can serve God. Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and all your strength. But then he says the second commandment is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Building up others, loving your neighbors, working together as a team. That's what serving Jesus is all about. Maybe you heard the story about Horville Sash. Old story. Horville Sash had a very humble job in the offices of one of the largest corporations in New York City. He worked as a mail clerk on the lowest reaches of the building, uh, doing what he could do to help other people running errands, uh, particularly with the mail, but also running errands when needed to do anything he could do to help out. Uh, <clears throat> he, he thought about what happened on the floors above and above and above and above, but, but mostly he just focused on doing his job. Then came the day when Horville saw a bug scurrying across the floor in front of him. He raised up his foot to smash the bug, but then the bug said, please don't kill me. If you let me live, I'll give you three wishes. Well, Horville 
said to himself, I don't know whether this bug can give me three wishes or not, but you know, a talking bug is worth a lot of money anyway. So he let the bug live and the bug asked him what he wanted for the first wish. Horville said, I want to be promoted to the, to the second floor. I'm tired of being in the, being down here on the first floor. Promote me up. Well, the next day, Horville's boss came in and told him he's going to move him to the second floor and give him more responsibilities and put him in charge of more things. Horville walked up to the second floor like a conquering general. But soon he heard footsteps on the floor above him. And he said to the bug, you know, my second wish is to be promoted floor by floor until I reach the very top and tell him in charge of the company. Done, said the bug. And floor by floor, over the next few weeks, Horville moved up. He made his way through the ranks. Uh, third floor, fourth floor, 10th floor, 20th floor, 50th floor, 90th floor. Finally, the very top floor. Horville, as high as he could go, he's chairman of the board. He's the chief executive officer. Corner office, top floor of the building. Then one day, Horville heard footsteps above him. And he looked out in the hall and he saw a sign that said stairs. And he went up. And he found there's a rooftop up there and found one of his clerks near the edge of the building with his eyes closed. Horville said, what are you doing? What are you doing? The man said, I'm praying. To whom? The man pointed a finger toward the sky and said, I'm praying to God. Panic gripped Horville. There was a floor above him. He couldn't see it, but, but there's something above him. He saw the clouds, but he couldn't hear scuffling of feet. He said, you mean there's an authority over me? Horville then summoned the bug. It was time for his third and final wish. He said, make me God, make me the highest, put me in the kind of position that only God would hold if he were here on earth. So the next day, Horville Sash awakened to find himself back in the first floor, sorting the mail and doing what he could to help others do the best that they could. Uh, one question to ask about, about servant leadership is what can you do to build up the body? What can you do to help the team succeed? What if it's not about honors and glory for ourselves? What if it's not about fame and our name living forever, living in lights? What if servant leadership is about team success? How can you build up the team? What's your role in serving the body of Christ? How can you serve others? Notice Jesus first speaks of being a servant and then and, you know, a servant puts himself at the disposition of others. He, he serves, she serves. But then he takes it to the next level, to an extreme. He says, imagine you're a slave. A slave doesn't have any rights of their own. Imagine you're a slave and your whole duty then, your whole life is, is about serving other people. Uh, sometimes uh, he's moving us to this greater level of, of service. And, and this is a costly level of service. Who's to know what the cost might be? As we say, what can I do to help the team succeed? David Garrell has a wonderful book called Bearing the Cross on Martin Luther King Jr. And he says, uh, Garrell says in his book that the king did not seek power. He happened to be on the scene in Montgomery, Alabama, December 1955, when the bus, bus boycott began. And the young preacher was there helping out. He did not choose leadership. He just chose to help serve, help give people rides. And after a while, they chose him to be their leader. Uh, there's a saying in the civil rights movement, if Rosa Parks had not sat down, Martin uh, Luther King would not have stood up. But the events conspired to make King the leader of that movement. He chose to serve the public and then was chosen by the public to be the leader. 13 years go by. April 3rd, 1968, Memphis, Tennessee, the night before King was assassinated, Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech He's speaking in support of striking sanitation workers. King's speech ends with these words. Here, hear the leadership. Here, success being defined not by his glory, but by the movement, by the people's success. King says, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody. I, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. You hear the leadership about serving God. He says, and he's allowed me to, to go up the mountain 
And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. You hear the leadership about the people's success. We as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything, not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Martin Luther King Jr., a servant leader, leading about group success, about us being committed to do our part, to build up the team, build up the body, uh, to do the work of God. So leadership is about serving God first. It's about serving others and building up the team. And then, of course, it's about stepping forward. It's about living out that leadership role. The golden rule is an assertive command. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's not a passive command. Leadership is about stepping forward and, and doing what you need to do because that's what God has called you to do. You say, John, how big a deal is this anyway? You know, we're throwing in this, this leadership comment from Jesus. How important is this? Well, friends, it's important enough that Jesus brought it up again at the Last Supper. He brought it up again at the Last Supper. On the night before the cross, Jesus gathered his, his disciples together, his followers together for the Passover dinner. And it was a critical night. He knew it. Everything that happened, happened this night would be remembered forever. And he had a surprise for everybody because in that room, these people who wore sandals as they walked around everywhere, there should have been somebody designated to wash everybody's feet. They had a bucket there and they had a towel, but they didn't have any designated uh, foot washing person. So to their surprise, as Jesus had planned it, uh, he took off his outer robe and, and tied the towel around and, and poured water on and washed everybody's feet. Then he says, you see what I have done for you. Do this unto each other. Uh, Jesus giving the example of service, of humble service. I, I sometimes think it'd be a good idea if before board meetings or council meetings, if we didn't pass around a basin and bucket and towel and wash each other's feet like some churches do on Monday, Thursday, just to emphasize the idea that we're here to serve each other. But Jesus' point has, has more to do than just the ritual. His point, I think, is that he calls his servants, not to be too proud to take the lead in serving, not to be too proud to take the lead in washing feet and listening and helping in working together. Simon Sinek, a writer and, and speaker, I have this quote in the bulletin as well. He says, leadership's not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of the people in your charge. It's not about being in charge about taking care of the people in your charge. So friends, in your home, in your families, at work, and among your friends, be a servant leader. Be a Jesus-style leader. Serve God and serve others. Lead by building others up with your humility. Building others up with your love. Building others up with your sacrifice. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.